Welcome to Term Talk, a Federal Judicial Center video podcast. Each term, we discuss the Supreme Court cases most impactful to federal judges. Joining me is Erwin Chemerinsky, Dean of UC Berkeley Law School, and Professor Lori Levinson of Loyola Law School. Thank you, both of you, for uh, sharing your Fourth Amendment expertise with us today. Erwin, we're going to get into three important cases in a little more detail in a moment. But at the macro level, tell us what's happening with search and seizure this term. Well, it's interesting that all three cases were decided against the police. None are a major change in the law. I also found interesting that in two of the three cases, there's extensive discussion of the common laws that existed in 1791 when the Fourth Amendment was ratified. It's interesting how much the justices want to look back to history in deciding the meaning of the Fourth Amendment today in 2021. Now, Torres versus Madrid is a little different. We'll get to that in a minute. But let's start with Coniglia versus Strom and Lang versus California. Now, both involve the warrantless entry into a home, but for different reasons. Laurie, how about telling us about uh, Coniglia and the issues raised there? Absolutely, Jim. Coniglia actually raised something known as the community caretaking exception, something that hasn't been used a lot. And the court had to address whether it can be used at all when it involves a home, because the history of that exception went to a warrantless search of a vehicle. As we all know, that searches require under the Fourth Amendment a warrant, unless in fact there is an exception. So the question here is whether this community caretaking exception applies in all situations. Let me give you a little bit about the facts of this case. Coniglia, who was a bit disturbed, had left a weapon on the table and told his wife just to shoot him. Instead of doing that, she left. So she called the police for what they would say is a welfare call. Go out there, not to search for evidence of a crime, but to see what's going on. The police went out there, they saw him on the porch and they wanted him to go to the hospital for a psychiatric exam. But he said to them, don't take my guns, promise you won't take my guns. And off he went in an ambulance for the psychiatric exam. The police then did go inside his home and take his guns and without a warrant. So the government was arguing that this would fall under the community caretaking exception. So in Coniglia, though, the court declined to extend the community caretaker exception to the home. How did they come to that decision? What's the impact? Well, the Supreme Court said, look, we're not going to recognize at this point a community caretaking exception for the home. The home has a heightened level, almost a sacrosanct level of privacy and that we've never generally had that exception. Again, we've had it for a vehicle where we were quite concerned that there was a gun missing and it wasn't an inventory type search, but we've never allowed that broad exception for a home. So the court said, we're not going to do that here. Now, Chief Justice Roberts wrote a concurrence and the concurrences are actually important, Jim, in this case, because they sort of flesh out where we might be going with this exception. This was the only exception argued before the lower court, but there are other possible exceptions that could apply, like exigent circumstances. Erwin, this is another unanimous opinion by the court, but it too has three concurrences. So there are distinctions the court feels are important to emphasize. The police in Lang versus California rely on the fact that they were in hot pursuit, albeit of a misdemeanor, uh, to justify their entry onto the property. This case also presented an opportunity for a bright line rule that the court wasn't willing to draw. Why is hot pursuit important here? Lori was speaking about exceptions to the warrant requirement. Mm -hmm. Another exception to the warrant requirement is so-called hot pursuit. In cases like Warden versus Hayden and Peyton versus New York, the Supreme Court said, if the police are chasing somebody in hot pursuit, that individual enters a dwelling, the police can go in without a warrant. But those cases involved somebody who was suspected of a felony. The issue in Lang versus California is what if the underlying crime is a misdemeanor? Arthur Lang was driving in Sonoma County. He was playing his radio very loud. He was honking his horn. Such excessive noise is a misdemeanor under California law. Police officer wanted to pull Lang over. The officer put the lights on at the top of the car. But before Lang could be pulled over, 
He went into his driveway. He went to his garage. The officer entered the garage without a warrant. He saw that Lang was clearly intoxicated and arrested him for driving under the influence. Lang said that the officer violated the Fourth Amendment by coming out of his property into his garage without a warrant. The officer said it was in hot pursuit and thus it was justified even though it was a misdemeanor. So Erwin, why was the court comfortable saying usually but not always? Justice Kagan wrote the opinion for the court and you're absolutely right, she refused to articulate a bright line rule. What she said is misdemeanors range from relatively trivial offenses to quite serious offenses. So she didn't wanna say police always could enter when the crime is a misdemeanor, but nor did she wanna say police can never enter. She gave the factors that would influence whether police can enter if it's hot pursuit of someone who's committed a misdemeanor. She said, is there a danger of harm to others? Is there a risk to the safety of the officers? Is there a danger of destruction of evidence? What's the likelihood of flight? And under these circumstances, even if it's a misdemeanor, the officer can enter a dwelling in hot pursuit without a warrant. So what do you believe is the importance of the concurrences in this case? Chief Justice Roberts concurs in the judgment, and it's much more written like a dissent than a real concurrence. He believes there should be a bright line rule that officers should be able to enter where the underlying crime is a misdemeanor or felony. He says, we're asking officers to make split second choices, and it's unrealistic for them to be able to know at the time, is this a misdemeanor, is this a felony? Can I go in or can't I go in? Justice Kavanaugh tries to write, just Kavanaugh writes a concurring opinion, but she tries to say, there's really not that much difference between the majority and Chief Justice Roberts, because in reality, Police can almost always go in when there's a misdemeanor under Justice Kagan's approach. So it's gonna get in practical effect where Chief Justice Roberts wants to go. Now, Torres versus Madrid has no less interesting facts. It discusses what level of force constitutes the seizure of a person. Erwin, can you get us started on this case? Sure. In 1989 in Graham versus Connor, the Supreme Court said that excess police force is a seizure with the meaning of the Fourth Amendment. And the question here is whether and when Roxana Torres was seized. She was in the parking lot of her apartment building and walking to a car. Police officers came to the apartment building to investigate things totally unrelated to Roxana Torres. They wanted to talk to her when they saw her. She apparently didn't see the officers. She got in her car and an officer came to each side of the car. She thought she was being carjacked and decided to pull out quickly. The officer ordered to stop. When she didn't, they began firing at her. They fired 13 bullets at her. Two struck her. Many hit her car and seriously damaged it. She drove through the parking lot, through the bullets and got out. She went to a nearby shopping center and she found there a car that was unoccupied with its motor running. She stole the car got in it. She drove 75 miles then to a hospital where she checked in for treatment. Day later, the police came and arrested her. The issue before the Supreme Court was, was she seized at the time the bullet struck her? Or was she only seized when she was arrested the next day? That, of course, makes all the difference is whether there's a claim under the Fourth Amendment. So when did the majority of the court say the seizure begins? It's a five to three decision. Justice Barrett didn't participate. <laughs> Chief Justice Roberts writes the majority opinion. And he says, and I quote, that a seizure happens when there's the application of physical force with the intent to restrain. There's a seizure, even if the restraint wasn't successful. So when she was hit by the bullets, she was seized at that moment. And she can bring a claim that it was excess of force. Justice Gorsuch writes strong dissent drawn by Justice Thomas and Alito. Justice Gorsuch says she drove 75 miles. She was not seized during that time. So there wasn't a claim under the Fourth Amendment just because the bullets hit her. Laurie, other than being intrigued by the facts of these cases, where do they leave us? What are the takeaways? 
Well, let me start with Torres. I think that Torres is probably a much more important case for civil actions than it is for criminal cases, because the language in the case seems to suggest that Hodari is still in place, mm -hmm. and that in a criminal case where somebody's seeking to suppress evidence, if they keep running, then they are not seized, and that the evidence that they might be throwing out during that flight is going to be evidence that the law enforcement can collect. But when you step back and look at all of these cases, I think the takeaway is, one, the house is still the place with the most privacy. And the court is trying to protect that privacy by making sure that there are no unreasonable searches and seizures. Second, there are exceptions that apply, but the court doesn't want to expand those exceptions, at least on the cases they've had so far. So you can use the exception of the police needing to go in because somebody might be hurt and they want to render aid, but you have to develop the facts for that exception. That the community caretaking exception is still on the table for vehicles, but the court hasn't basically said this will be all right for homes and is waiting for the facts developed to show that. And that finally, as Erwin mentioned, when it comes to misdemeanors, there is no per se rule of hot pursuit allowing you to go into their home and their curtilage and their garage. And when it comes to flight, there is the standard for civil cases as to whether they intended to stop the person and actually make physical contact. But for criminal cases, if the suspect continues to run, there is no seizure yet. Erwin, tell us what you think the impact of these decisions uh, will be on the district courts. I very much agree with what Lori just said. I would also identify two methodological points. One is the extent to which the court emphasizes looking at the common law as it existed in 1791 and deciding the meaning of the Fourth Amendment today. In both Lang and Torres, there's great discussion of what was permissible and not allowed back in 1791. I think here you see the influence of originalists on the Supreme Court. And second, you see the court is avoiding bright line rules. That really means that in many instances, what the district courts need to do is examine the totality of the circumstances in deciding there's a violation of the Fourth Amendment. And I agree. I think that the district courts have to be developing the facts because the Supreme Court has made very clear that they're deciding these rules and their applications on it based upon the facts before. Laurie Irwin, it is always a pleasure and I look forward to talking with you again. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.